never seen a spin-off show make their life more difficult. I thought this show followed Kiara's son, Simba's grandchild. But no guys, the first thing you should know about this show is that this is Simba's second child, Kiara's younger brother. How is this possible? Why doesn't Lion King 2 acknowledge him? What is that little gremlin? I'll explain everything. What lovers? Welcome back to the lore series where we explore shows no one else is brave enough to. Now I grew up with Disney's The Lion King movies, even the weird one and a half one about the meerkat and warthog Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Yeah, these characters are based off of Shakespeare and I don't want to say that The Lion King made me a child of the theater, but they kind of did. I however never watched The Lion Guard until now. This show aired from 2015 to 2019, totaling three seasons and 75 episodes overall, including the pilot movie. Usual disclaimer, I actually do cut a little. My videos are for young adults and adults who want to overanalyze these shows for a goof and a laugh, and if you hate that sort of thing, I don't know, there's the door. First, let's briefly summarize The Lion King from 1994 and The Lion King 2, Simba's Pride from 1998. The first Lion King movie follows a young Simba preparing to be king. A uh, Lion King, if you will. <laughs> Simba's father, Mufasa, is an icon. He casually drops the most iconic lines in the entire franchise. Look, Simba, everything the light touches is our kingdom. They live in the Pride Lands and rule from Pride Rock. Their mission is to protect the circle of life which connects all living creatures. If that sounds vague to you, it's because it is. We're, we're gonna get into it. But not everyone respects the circle of life. Simba's uncle, Scar, is very obviously evil. He's like monologuing to himself and shit, but no one notices this except for us. We see him with his hyena henchman, but there's nothing we can do to stop him. This is the opposite of Frozen. No sisterly love here, just brotherly hate. Scar sends the hyenas to start a stampede of wildebeests to kill Simba and Mufasa. Simba survives because his dad saves him. But when Mufasa reaches out to his brother Scar for help, Scar grabs him with his claws and whispers, Long live the king, and just tosses him off of the ledge. Simba didn't see that Scar did this, but he did see that his dad is dead. He believes he was killed trying to save him, which is half true, but he took on all the responsibility when obviously it wasn't his fault. But he is a kid, and his uncle Scar, somebody he's supposed to trust, confirms these feelings of guilt, and Scar tells Simba to run away and never return. Simba is adopted by Timon and Pumbaa. Many years later, Simba reunites with his childhood friend Nala, and they fall in love. Things get really steamy because this is when Disney had balls. Simba returns to the Pride Lands to save it from Scar's reign of terror. The soundtrack also slaps, and it was turned into a Broadway musical. The first movie people believe is based on Hamlet, so we're keeping the Shakespeare going, and the second movie is a retelling of Romeo and Juliet. Simba has a daughter, Kiara, and he's giving her the same talk. You're going to rule the Pride Lands one day, blah 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 blah. Kiara meets Kovu and the entire movie is about their forbidden love, because Kovu is part of Scar's clan. They cannot emphasize enough how not related Kovu is to Scar, but his mother very clearly had a fling with Scar, so how... How sure are they of this? And our love isn't forbidden because we're related or anything, because we're not, <laughs> right? You know, the more they say it, the less convinced and guilty they sound. Then there was this kiss the girl number orchestrated by Rafiki. Rafiki is the royal family's source of wisdom, spiritual guidance, and also a uh, matchmaker, apparently. We get a lot more information about Rafiki's role in the Lion Guard series. Anyway, Kovu's family consists of his mother, Zira, who tried to get him to kill Simba, his older brother, Nuka, who died trying to kill Simba, and his older sister, Vitani. In the end, Kovu's sister, Vitani, also switched sides because she just wanted the fighting to stop. When Zira, her own mother, said, Then you will die too. All the other lionesses were like, Oh, you went too far. And they all switched sides. Then you will die as well. At her own daughter, though? No. The battle led to Zira hanging over rushing water. Kiara tried to save her, but Zira rather die. She'd rather die than get help from Kiara. How did they create a whole Playhouse Disney show about Kiara's unseen younger brother? So now we finally meet Kion. He's friends with this little menace honey badger named Bunga. Honey badger don't give a shit. That's very true, actually. The fruit Kion and Bunga were playing ball with rolled into the Outland, so Bunga went to retrieve it. Hyenas scooped the little honey badger up, and this is when Kion's powers he didn't even know he possessed were activated for the first time. Hear the roar! 
and a mark very briefly appeared on his shoulder. They were this far away from Pride Rock, by the way, and Nala exclaimed, that was Kion's roar? When Simba tries to explain what the hell is going on, we get this fun callback. Son, we need to talk. Oh, no, Dad, we already had that talk. Can you feel the love tonight? I know all about that mushy stuff. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's not that, Kion. He seems very young to have had the talk already, but I'd be lying if I said I knew how their culture and customs worked. And it gets even more confusing with this knowledge. Kion has the roar of the ancestors, and the entire time they were explaining it for the first time, I was fuming. Like, what the fuck? Kiara can't have shit. Finally, there's a queen, a matriarch, then this little shit comes out of nowhere and is the fiercest animal in the Pride Lands, as Simba says. Now Kion has to assemble the Lion Guard. Oh, like the name of the show, guys. Kion asks his dad to explain the Lion Guard to him, and I was half expecting Simba to be like, I have no fucking idea. No, no, just kidding. They do explain it, but it's pretty weird. Scar was the last royal family member to lead the Lion Guard and possess the roar of the ancestors. He had a whole group, but then when he told the group he wanted to take down Mufasa, the group said no. No, we're not gonna assassinate the king, actually. That's a stupid idea. Scar was like, oh, you think that's a stupid idea? Well, you're dead now. He used the roar on his whole group. And that's how he lost the roar. This is clever because it explains why it skipped a generation, like Simba doesn't have a younger brother to have these powers. But it's also really silly because it implies that the ancestors helped Scar kill that group of people. And then they just turned around like, eh, 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 you shouldn't have done that. Do they have no choice in the matter? If Scar used the roar to kill Mufasa, would they have just let him? Also, how did he explain where the group went and how he lost his tattoo without any suspicion? What lie did he come up with to completely fly under the radar? So anyway, the roles of the Lion Guard are fiercest, which is always the royal family's second born, so in this case, Kion. And now he has to assemble the bravest, strongest, fastest, and keenest of sight. The first member recruited is Bunga the Honey Badger as the bravest. Hmm, all the other Lion Guard seem to be made up of lions, but I'm sure that won't be a problem. Ew, that yeah, apparently Simba agrees. We'll get there in a second. We learned that Bunga was raised by Timon and Pumbaa just as Simba was. Timon and Pumbaa tried to teach Bunga their philosophy of Hakuna Matata, which means no worries for the rest of your days. But Bunga's philosophy is Zukazama, which in Swahili means pop up, dive in. He sang a little song about it. It was good, but it didn't hold a candle to Hakuna Matata. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just being real. The first song that really hit for me was the hyena song. They killed it. All the villain numbers are really good. After we hear about the hyena's plan to attack before the lion guard is ready for them, we see the lion guard being assembled. Oh no, the egret is invited onto the lion guard to be the keenest of sight. Beshti the hippo is the strongest, and Fuli the cheetah is the fastest. The setup of the new characters is pretty solid. My biggest criticism of the pilot, and honestly of the series overall, is the characterization of the characters we met in the movies. They decided to make Kiara a tattletale very reminiscent of Candace and Phineas and Fur when I really never got that vibe from Lion King 2. And Simba's just an asshole throughout. Exhibit A, in this episode, he's downright furious the Lion Guard isn't just made up of lions. And worse than that, he's saying this in front of the other children. Kion, your team sucks. No offense. But have you seen them? No offense. Kion has a monologue that turns into a song to himself main character moment. And then mid-song, his grandfather Mufasa starts talking to him in the clouds. They already dropped a Mufasa cameo? They make it very common here, which obviously disregards how rare it was in the movies. In Lion King 2, Simba was begging for Mufasa's guidance during a way more pivotal moment. And all he got back was crickets. After Kion's little I'm the Chosen One song, they all got matching tattoos to celebrate the occasion. And now they have to protect gazelles from being killed by hyenas, which would throw off the circle of life. To their credit, they actually did explain what they were doing to upset the circle of life here. It wasn't that they were hunting. It was that they already killed enough gazelles to feed their entire group, but they wanted more than their fair share. Kion even said they won't stop until they got the whole herd. Yeah, that's whack. Kion, do the war. <laughs> First successful mission of the Lion Guard, roll credits. Let's address some big questions before we get into the real plot that really picks up in season two and three. Please clap. If 
the Lion Guard protects and defends everyone, then what does the royal family do? Yeah, we're starting there. How do Pride Land's politics work? The way this show expanded the world makes what Simba does for the Pride Lands feel very small and inconsequential. We really start to see how each group of animals have their own customs and traditions, and even their own system of government. In Season 1, Episode 3, The Rise of Maku, we see the crocodile's way of choosing a leader. Maku challenged the current crocodile leader to a Mashindano. This conflict started with Pua, the current crocodile leader, taking the hippo's word for how many fish there were for them, and if there's enough. But Maku feels they deserve more and shouldn't wait for the hippos to tell them when to eat. Maku ended up winning the physical fight much to everyone's dismay. So Maku is the new crocodile leader. But Maku doesn't respect the circle of life! This guy's gonna be a handful! This series also tackles the royal family's harmful prejudices, which I thought was the whole point of the second movie. But Kion actually learns this lesson before his dad in the episode Never Judge a Hyena by Its Spots. Jasiri is a hyena, but she's nice and respects the circle of life. Kion immediately distrusts her, saying hyena, in a tone that couldn't make it more obvious that he thinks she's scum of the earth for the species she is. Okay, Zootopia. Kion learns his lesson and him and Jasiri are friends now, but back to that Zootopia comparison, another way it's similar to that movie is this episode is incredibly shippy. It really felt like they were amping up for a lion hyena romance, which I understand doesn't make sense, but if Timon and Pumbaa can make it work, I don't know, I had hope. In the season one episode, Can't Wait to be Queen, Kiara is queen for a day while Simba and Nala are visiting Kilio Valley for an elephant funeral of Simba's elephant friend, Aminia. Nifu. No, not Ami Nifu! Ami Nifu was my favorite character from the first Lion King. I'll never forget when he said, y You're a wizard, Simba. It, ah, it gives me chills every time. No idea who this guy is. We only heard about all the good he did for the Pride Lands once he passed away. His wiki picture is him dead as hell. Bruh. Simba's one job was to give a tribute to this elephant in Elephant Tees. This proves two things. One, different species not only have their own customs, but they can also have their own language. And two, Simba can't do anything right. During his tribute, he messed up his pronunciation and accidentally said that the dead guy had poop on him. Luckily, the elephants had a really good sense of humor about it. But Simba, this is the one time we actually see you have an important duty, and instead you took a big duty all over it. We'll look into the other ways Simba's characterization is ass in a bit. In the episode Kupatana Celebration, we learn about the Kupatana Celebration. This is the one day a year all the animals in the Pride Lands come together to celebrate the circle of life in peace. The one day a year? What if a new royal line is born? Look at all this celebrating, look at all the animals that showed up. Moving on, Kion was watching a baby jackal get chased by hyenas and exclaimed, I wish the Lion Guard defended the Outlands. And then Simba essentially said, well, because it's a holiday all about peace, you could defend the Outlands today. And Kion's like, that makes total sense. Thanks, Dad. So they wouldn't have helped the baby jackals if it wasn't the Kupatana celebration. Also, the worst part of all of this is that all the jackals, including the babies, were scam artists. I hope we swing back around to this because I hate the idea of an entire species being evil. That's kind of against the whole episode Don't Judge a Hyena by its spots. They never fully redeem the jackals. Don't make a whole species evil. Unless it's mosquitoes. Fuck mosquitoes. One cannot mention Pride Land's politics without mentioning the circle of life. They used to describe disturbing the circle of life as when an animal takes more than their fair share. But their definition keeps changing. In the episode The Call of the Drongo, the Lion Guard claims that this bird imitating how other animals sound to trick them is against the circle of life. How? Everyone needs a strategy in hunting and gathering food. And this is his. What's wrong with that? If they're gonna argue it's rude or stealing or whatever, how do you suggest he lives? Because no one was sharing food with him before this. So I ask again, what is the circle of life? In the episode The Imaginary Akape, a leopard is in the Pride Lands, and since he's not from around here, the gazelles don't know that he's a predator, so they don't run away when he's around. The Lion Guard solution is to kick out the leopard because he doesn't belong here. Why not instead just warn all the prey animals? Their whole defending the circle of life gig gets really weird when they let people get away with hunting, but God forbid somebody crosses their imaginary border and does the same thing. Plus the Lion Guard knew what a leopard was, so maybe this isn't an issue of the leopard being out of place and more so an issue of the prey of the Pride Lands not being educated enough. 
In the episode The Trouble with Galagos, the Lion Guard befriends a cowardly leopard and teaches him how to stand up for himself. I guess they only like timid predators because the moment you're too good at your job, they hate you. Like, why did they have to save that Akapi from two episodes ago? Why couldn't the leopard hunt it? Uh, because he was mean about it. But more importantly, they befriended the prey. So does defending the circle of life mean just defending your friends? How does the royal family decide who to hunt? Are the animals they kill just like, ow, ow, oh my god, they're killing me. Oh, the king, sir, it's an honor. And if they aren't kiss asses until the day they die, they can just negotiate themselves out of being eaten. Kion is about to have an antelope for dinner until the antelope screams, ow! Lion Guard, help me! Uh, wh what seems to be the problem? You! I don't want to be eaten! You know what? That's fair. I'm gonna head out. In the season two episode, The Traveling Baboon Show, these acrobatic magician baboons put on a show as a distraction and steal from the audience members. Classic. The Lion Guard stop them because they are taking more than their fair share, which disrupts the circle of life, and the baboons run away to the Outlands. The hyenas are now chasing the baboons, and the Lion Guard decides to help the baboons because they wouldn't be in the Outlands if they didn't chase them out there in the first place. What? No. They wouldn't be in the Outlands if they didn't steal. Why won't they just let the hyenas eat even in their own territory? Jonja, the leader of this small group of hyenas, even said, I saw them stealing from me. And Beshti responds, so they deserve to get eaten? No, dude, they deserve to get eaten because the hyenas are hungry. What are they allowed to eat? When are they allowed to eat? Under what circumstances are these hyenas allowed to eat? In the episode Ono and the Egg, a hawk apparently can't hunt these hyraxes because this isn't hawk territory. How are any of the predators supposed to hunt effectively when they're confined to certain areas? All right, zebras, we need some big, beautiful grass. Should we graze in this peaceful meadow or in the scary area with all the things that want to kill us? An episode that actually successfully shows off an animal's role in the Pride Lands is Beshti and the Hippo Lanes. Beshti and his dad flatten all the overgrown plants to help all the other animals cross the floodplain safely. They call this the Hippo Lanes. It's the Pride Lands version of control traffic and preventing accidents after flooding. Beshti and his dad also save a rhino from the crocodiles. Maku has not stopped his villainous ways. We also have more insight into the circle of life and the laws of their land. Apparently the floodplains are a safe zone after a storm. Does safe zone mean no hunting allowed? Are animals only allowed to hunt in certain areas and if so why would animals ever leave these safe zones? Well in this specific instance the floodplains allow animals to work together to survive a storm. So maybe once this area is dried out again it'll be a free for all? It's unclear, but any clarification about the circle of life is much appreciated. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! I hate the way they write Simba so much. And he's voiced by Rob Lowe. What? Such a bad day for the girlies that loved Simba in the movies. It's me. I'm girlies. My Simba suspicion started in the episode The Mambali Fields Migration, when Simba sent the Lion Guard to lead a migration of gazelles and zebras. My notes from this episode read, actual question, what does Simba do? Then in the episode Bunga and the King, my god, it gets so much worse. He demands respect for being a king with kingly duties, which according to this episode include, uh going to an elephant concert. And he can't even do that right because he gets stuck in a sinkhole and lashes out at the one kid trying to help him. You do remember who you're talking to, don't you? I know who you are. You're still the king. I'm also the king. <laughs> Someone's this man is a whiny idiot baby. In probably the most important episode of season one, Lions of the Outlands, we see Kovu and his siblings and his mom Zira. Guys, I know them from the second movie. This is our first clear indication of a timeline. When Kion talked to Kovu about his family and Kiara, it was obvious Kovu already knew Kiara. Back to the Pride Lands? That means I can see Kiara again. You know Kiara? Yeah. Uh, it was a while ago. So here's what I was leading up to. We have another classic Simba being an idiot moment. How do you not tell your son about this group? Rafiki had to be the one to explain to Kion that Simba banished these guys before he was born. Which is true, the first banishment did take place before Kion was born, but Simba also banished them again immediately after Kovu and Kiara met. Was this also before Kion was born? Highly unlikely. How disconnected is Kion from his family that he doesn't know anything 
about this. Like, even his sister didn't talk to him about this. And you know what's the worst part? Simba could have been useful in the series if Kion confided in him instead of his dead grandfather. You will never be Mufasa. Uh, I mean, was Kiara wrong? One kingly duty that isn't a load of shit is making alliances. And in the episode The Lost Gorillas, we learned that years ago, Simba and King Sokwe of the Mountain Gorillas signed a peace treaty. It's really interesting to see the societies outside of the Pride Lands, and this is something they really explore in season three. But more importantly, King Simba did something that wasn't total horse shit. <laughs> Or zebra shit, I don't even think they know what horses are. Although when he sent Kion to retrieve the message from the King of the Gorillas, my first instinct was to say, why can't Simba do this himself? But I think Simba tries to remain at Pride Rock as much as possible, so none of their enemies see his absence as an in. Also, I've been told many times that I have to mention that the Mountain Gorillas' sons are voiced by Dan and Phil. Here's the thing, I was also made aware that these characters were supposed to also act like Dan and Phil. They should definitely take that as an insult. These characters fucking suck. Based on everything, everything I've seen from them, they don't act like that. These characters were not important to the series and were obnoxious, and if it weren't for these two very popular YouTubers voicing them, I wouldn't have even put this in the script. Anyway, there's your mention. I think at some point they must have known they were writing Simba to be an obnoxious, headstrong asshole, because the episode The Trail to Odugu really spells out why he's like this. Trail to Odugu is a royal tradition between siblings. Simba never got to do this because his dad died before their family can be complete. And also he was banished by his evil uncle. Don't make me empathize with him. Also, the whole trail to Udugu is a lesson in teamwork, a lesson Simba never got, which explains a lot. But it also makes me wonder how Scar and Mufasa's trail to Udugu went. When I was watching, I wrote this note. I hope we get to see flashbacks of Mufasa and Scar. I want to know when Scar became a villain. Is it for some stupid ass reason like Esteban and Elena of Avalor, or was there a more understandable turning point? Um, stay tuned. We get all of the above. Uh... We do get a flashback, and we also get an explanation that's somehow both stupid and understandable. I'm getting ahead of myself, as usual. Anyway, Simba is leading the Lion Guard while Kion and Kiara are on their sibling adventure. Bunga has a whole song about how Simba's pampered and does no work. Damn it, I never wanted to agree with Bunga, but is he wrong? Look at that. Exactly, he doesn't do anything. Down with the monarchy. Simba is once again not being a team player, just barking orders. The only thing he knows how to do. He would benefit from Mufasa's nuggets of wisdom more than his son at this point. My son, stop being a bitch. Simba is having his own trail to a Dugu, but instead of learning from his peers, these literal children have to teach him how to not be a headstrong jerk. The episode ends with Simba saying, Someday you will be responsible for all of this. Oh, Dad. <laughs> we already are. What? No. I am. What do you do successfully? Quickly. Now here's what really pisses me off, because back during my Sophia the First lore video, people were defending King Roland, saying, you know what, he may not be a good leader, but at least he's a good stepdad to Sophia. And that's true. I'm gonna go so far as to say Simba is not a good dad. At least not to Kion. On top of Kion being out of the loop about everything, in the season two episode, The Savannah Summit, we hear that The Savannah Summit is when the king invites leaders of all the different animal groups together so they can discuss peace. I was already questioning Simba's decision-making a few minutes in. He he invited Maku, the leader of the crocodiles. And the other animals are bickering about it, even saying, can you believe Simba invited Maku? Their mistrust of Maku is making them question their trust of the king. I think he should have warned them at least. The episode goes on and Kion also doesn't trust Maku, which led to a misunderstanding where Kion pounced on Maku even though Maku wasn't doing anything wrong in this particular moment. Sure, Kion was making assumptions about Maku, but these assumptions were based on the many, many times the Lion Guard had to stop Maku from doing shady shit in the past, something Simba would know nothing about. But when Kion accidentally stopped a negotiation from happening, Simba accused him of ruining the summit and then sent him to fix it. He just wants to ruin it. You may have ruined it. I... I'm sorry, Dad. Then find a way to fix it. Simba, you snappy bitch! He's ten! Why don't you fix it? Sure. Kion slipped up a bit, but if Simba stepped up and took more of the responsibility for Maku all these times in the past, he probably would have banished him by now. Like he did with Kobu and his family, like he did with the vultures, like he did with the hyenas, the list goes on and on. Maybe the Lion Guard does all this work so there can still be animals in the Pride Lands for you to rule over. But Kion pounces on Maku, so you pounce on him? Your own son? I don't think so. Well, in 
that case, my advice is... Panic and run! Panic and run! A lot of these more laid-back episodes of the Lion Guard just dealing with the background characters really shows off how boisterous and silly these civilians are. In the episode Follow That Hippo, the Lion Guard meets a group of children who are playing by pretending to be them. Oh. And Bunga asks, who plays as him? And one of the kids responded with, whoever chooses last. <laughs> What an icon. Speaking of icon, this zebra is just too much. Claiming he's the tastiest animal in the Pride Lands? Putting the pride in Pride Lands. I can't tell you how much I love this guy. This over-the-top silly goofball is also offended that the Lion Guard is protecting children before him. If you don't save me, you're homophobic. Dude, we have to save the children. Ew. Why? In the episode Beshti and the Hippo Lanes, the antelopes are being so annoying. <laughs> the Lion Guard is leading them to safety and telling them what to do so they don't die. And they're acting all pissy because they want the Lion Guard to say please. Ew, fuck this guy, just let Maku eat him. Luckily, an episode that shows that the future generation will be less incompetent is the season two episode Bunga the Babysitter. Bunga was watching a group of kids and at first I was like, wow, how stupid could the parents be? But through playing with them the entire episode, Bunga actually teaches these these kids self-defense. This is such a great use of Bunga's character. Probably the best Bunga episode ever. Lastly, I want to mention that Zazu is barely in the series, but we have one episode that really follows him called The Morning Report. This episode gives us a flashback that shows how present he was in watching and protecting Kion and the rest of the Lion Guard. It's not only incredibly sweet, but it also strengthens what we know about this character from the first two movies. He's fiercely loyal and hardworking and yet constantly disrespected. What? This is where the show fully lost me. The immersion is gone. Why is Rafiki mentioning Christmas? Listen, I love the holiday almost a weird amount, but why is it being celebrated by these creatures with such different customs? Is Rafiki going to explain Lion Jesus being born to us? That sounds like a Lion King adaptation that that Scamilton church would put on. Let there be light! Now Jesus. Everything the light touches will be your kingdom. Are you ready for this? Timon and Pumbaa introduced Christmas to the Pride Lands because they heard from a friend of a friend of a flying reindeer. Uh, yep. Uh, they even talked about dandy claws as Bunga cheesed yeah. into the camera. This makes me want to chuck my computer into the Grand Canyon. That was a homework machine reference. I found a tweet that claims that the Lion King's original film director said that humans don't exist in this world, so why is this happening? Who is dandy claws if not a human. And it's not even just a throwaway joke either. The main conflict of this episode is Timon crying that Dandy Claws has never come to visit. He is in straight up agony over this. The entire Pride Lands came together and sang their rendition of the 12 days of Christmas. Why didn't I skip this episode? I think Christmas celebrates the gift of the circle of life. There are only two good things to come out of this episode. One, Pumbaa dressed as Santa for Timon. Did you know that they're in love? Did you know that? And two, now I have a clip that I'm going to use as a reaction to everything. Oh, my friend Selfie they just posted? It's giving! The Athena P YouTube channel? It's giving! You better stop! The season two two-part special, The Rise of Scar, completely changed this series' tone. It became a lot less episodic, and all of a sudden, new characters and villains were popping up left and right. My notes went from, haha, zebra made me laugh, to the villains actually gained territory and brought back a deceased dictator from the dead? I'm scared! So the first new character we meet is Makini. She's training to be the future Royal Majuzi under the current Royal Majuzi, Rafiki. Royal Majuzis are knowledge keepers. Rafiki and Makini are both mandrels. So are mandrels always the knowledge keeper? It's looking like the answer is yes. The way Rafiki described that Makini is the right age to be training as an apprentice is by the new stripes on her face and the color of her nose. These are mandrel characteristics. Maybe no other creature possesses this gift even if they tried. Majuzis can talk to lions of the past. But when Makini saw Kion talking to his grandfather, she herself couldn't see Mufasa yet. We also learned that each Majuzi chooses their own staff. The Bakura staff Staff includes two gourds, one for the future and one for the past. One last thing about this character's profession and destiny is that the lions of the past chose Makini for this role. Why would the lions know? Why wouldn't it be the past Majuzis? Do only lions go to heaven? Moving on, we see the new elephant leader struggling to find underground water. But this is not only her duty, but also a job only an elephant can do. Really leaning into what each animal is good at. And fun fact, elephants actually do find underground water in real life. This can only mean one thing. Mandrels are magical in real life as well. This is also the episode where we learn that Fooly is the first girl member of the Lion Guard. 
ever. Pretty badass. Everyone in my comments is constantly hyping this character up. In my opinion, she has the coolest ability and one of the best voices, like her singing is phenomenal. But I'm about to drop a hot take. I wasn't really interested in Fooly as a character until season three. Before season three, all she did was exclaim, seriously? And roll her eyes. I understand not every character has to be sociable, but the only girl in the group's defining feature is being annoyed by everything got very annoying to me. She's a fan favorite, so I can't imagine this hot take going over well. But do me a favor if you're typing out a very angry comment, take a deep breath, walk away from the computer or phone, and have a glass of water. You're not you when you're thirsty. <laughs> Yeah. Ooh, that, those were fighting words. I'm kidding. It's fine. It's, it's, we're just joking. Anyway, this show had the most slow burn butterfly effect villain origin story I've ever seen for this snake, Ushari. He was an ongoing joke. Animals didn't notice him and he'd constantly be trampled. His way of gaining power and preventing the hyenas from eating him was to summon the spirit of Scar from Makini's staff. I wish this special was named something else because that reveal could have been even more insane. Oh, and these skinks? Don't slut shame those lizards. I didn't. Shut up. These skinks are also siding with Ushare, and in the next episode, Let the Sleeping Crocs Lie, they act as spies, telling the villains crucial information. Seeing Scar back in the flames of this volcano was way more badass than this show had any right to be. I know this show was thought up 18 years after The Lion King 2's premiere, but it pissed me off that the events of The Lion Guard were never mentioned in the movie. This plot and a whole last son could not have flown under the radar. Scar's supposedly a adopted son? Well, we've dealt with bigger issues before. Yeah, like when Scar was back from the dead and I defeated him? I'm your son, by the way. Kaburi is the new crocodile villain, just as the other one was making amends. Wild timing. Kaburi is challenging Maku, and during the traditional crocodile battle for leadership called the Mashindano, remember, we saw one in season one. Anyway, during the Mashindano, Kaburi ordered three of his henchmen to try and assassinate Simba. Holy shit! Season two is caking it up about 15 notches. As punishment for a failed assassination, Kaburi and his followers were banished to the Outlands. But that's where he was recruited by the other villains, and Scar saying, I have a plan at him. It was awesome. Very briefly in the season one episode, Lions of the Outlands, Zira, you know, Kobu's mom, taught Kion that if he were to roar at a cloud, he could make it rain. She knew this since she was entangled with Scar. Yeah, when he made it rain on me in the club, I knew he was the one. So Kion uses this weather power in the season two episode, Swept Away. It's the dry season and he wanted to help the zebras that were stuck in the hardened land. Once again, I don't know how bending the will of mother nature is defending the circle of life, it seems like they're actively fighting against it. During the flash flood Kion accidentally started, Veshti got separated from the group. So the Outlanders tried to kill him. The stakes are so much higher this season. The dry season has been such a nightmare. It's the perfect atmosphere to build tension because it is hell. And in the episode Rescue in the Outlands, there's a new layer to this torture. All these goddamn flies. We are introduced to a new villain, a monitor lizard named Kenji. Kenge. Kenge is how you say his name. He has a venomous bite that temporarily paralyzed Kion, Fooly, and Beshti. Makini is tasked with making an antidote for them, while Ono and Bunga go off to fight Kenji, Kenji. the monitor lizard, and the hyenas. During the fight, they're both bitten, and now only Bunga can move, because he's immune to venom. Well, in the show. In real life, honey badgers aren't completely immune. Makini has now destroyed her, at this point, third Bakora staff, to help Bunga in the fight. I cannot believe the villains lost to these two. I mean, I knew it was coming, but wow, these villains are incompetent. It's like this is a kid show or something. Psh, you're telling me one of the main characters doesn't get eaten Animal Planet style right here on Playhouse Disney? <laughs> wow, that's crazy. I need you to know that after that episode is when the Christmas episode is. They dropped that fucking Christmas episode smack in the middle of an animal war. The tone shift almost made me rage quit, but I persevered because I'm strong and brave. In the episode Divide and Conquer, the jackals and hyenas are working together, with the jackals creating a distraction and the hyenas trying to take out Rafiki, which, uh, good luck with that. I wondered why Scar kept trusting the hyenas, and my sister said, well, what with the hyenas killing him in the first movie? Maybe he was trying to be nicer so that people wouldn't turn on him again. Which makes sense, but he's already 
dead. How would they kill him again? Would they just piss on the hell flames? I don't know. I didn't buy it. The hyenas kept messing up his plans, and it seemed like his patience was wearing thin. All I know is this episode ended with Kion kind of seeing Scar, but not trusting his own eyes. But the symbol that was left behind indicated great evil. Dun dun dun. The next episode, The Scorpion Sting, we meet another new villain, Sumo the Scorpion. At this point, Scar has assembled a pretty large group. He decides he wants to take Simba down today at the Kumbuka celebration. This is when the Pride Lands celebrate Simba defeating Scar. Scar has such a flair for the dramatics. The takedown could happen any day. In fact, why not wait until you can recruit your widow and children? But no, this is an ego trip. He wants to arrive on the scene like, <laughs> you thought you got rid of me? Then explain this? Me being here and shit. The scorpion successfully stung the king, making him faint in front of everyone. Which sounds like a victory, but Scar's plan fell through almost immediately. Like, sure, he almost killed Simba, but key word, almost. The lion guard successfully brought back volcanic ash, which healed him. And not only that, Scar showed his whole hand of cards, enough for them to prepare. In the episode The Wisdom of Kongwe, Simba is finally talking to Mufasa as well. Mufasa is just there whenever you need him, except for in the movies. In the episode Undercover King Yonga, the Lion Guard task a chameleon with being a spy for them. The chameleon hears that Scar and the rest of the villains are planning on blocking the Pride Land's only source of water during the dry season, and the Lion Guard took down the villains by camouflaging themselves. I really love this plot point because it's clear that they're learning from the other creatures in the Pride Lands. This show definitely surprised me with how much they utilize background characters. Like, even if they are a one-off character, they have their, their moment to shine. In the episode The Hyena Resistance, Kion offered Jasiri and the other good hyena as refuge in the Pride Lands, but Jasiri says the Outlands is her home and she wants to defend it. Also, I did not see Janja having a crush on Jasiri coming, what? and I feel like an idiot because of that, but here's the thing, here's the thing. I thought he was a fully grown man. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know he was a kid slash teen, but that's a thing. He... He very much has a crush on her. Didn't see that coming. I'm stupid. In the fall of Mizimu Grove, the Outlanders find out that Scar is back. At first, this was a secret kept between the Lion Guard and the royal family, because they didn't want the civilians to panic and run. But this led to almost everyone wanting to move away for safety. They also felt betrayed. They were like, this is kind of important information. You definitely should not have kept us in the dark about this. In the end, through a moving Kion speech, they decided to stay and defend their land and each other. Big theme of community in this show. It also shows that these groups of animals choose to be led by Simba. They could leave any time they want. So whether or not I think Simba is a good leader, it's clear that all the animals trust him and respect him enough to stay. I thought the end of season two would complete that storyline, but everything gets wrapped up in the premiere of season three instead. Oh my god, who the hell so in the very beginning of season three, we get a time jump. I believe about a year has passed and the Lion Guard has been doing a good job of defending the Pride Lands. But Simba comes to the conclusion that they're never actually going to defeat Scar unless they ship to offense. So they decide to invade the Outlands. And I think that was a good call on Simba's part. I I'm gonna give him credit here. Janja is feeling conflicted on whether or not he wants to join Jasiri. Dude, what? I really thought, and I feel stupid for this now, but I really thought that Kion and Jasiri were gonna get together. No interspecies relationship in the Pride Lands because that's too unrealistic. But they can celebrate Christmas? Okay. The skinks are snitches and bitches because they tell Scar about Janja's not so internal conflict because he was he was singing about it out loud. So what does Scar do when he realizes Janja's gone soft? He guilt trips him. He's like, Janja, I will die. Janja, you don't want me to die, do you? And all of a sudden I'm rooting for Janja to join the good side because this emotional manipulation is sad and pathetic to watch. Even more brutal than that, unbeknownst to Janja, Scar is trying to get rid of the Lion Guard and Janja and his group of hyenas all in one. End of part one, Janja officially joined the good side. I wish it was a bit more slow burn than that, but when some Somebody set off a giant fire trying to kill you and you realize your leader doesn't give a shit about you? I guess quick burn does make sense. That's enough for anyone to 180 no matter how stupid. Part 2 opens with Scar saying, You wanna know how I got this Scar? And then he proceeds to sing as a flashback played out. It all started with this strange lion. Scar being the leader of the guard, ironically enough, let his guard down. And that's when this lion sicked a snake on him. That's how he got his Scar. That's... That's how the villain number goes, by the way. It's such a silly villain number. It's like he got distracted looking in the mirror. I'm a scar. I'm a scar. 
God. So this other lion, with the negotiation skills of a pastrami sandwich, says, Ha ha, I'll give you the antidote, but you answer to me now. And Scar said, and I quote, I think the fuck not, and blasted their asses. But what hurt more than that was when Mufasa went up to him and said, <laughs> You got Scar. I'm gonna call you Scar now. <laughs> Scar? Scar. Scar? Scar. That's your name now. Which doesn't seem like a Mufasa thing to do. So naturally, when Scar gets a nickname he doesn't like, he keeps it and plans on killing his brother for giving the nickname to him. <laughs> Whoa. Two problems. One, this origin story is very different than the one told in the book, The Tale of Two Brothers. And two, it seems like in this show, they don't acknowledge that the hyenas ripped Scar apart. They keep acting like he died in the fire. Anyway, Scar sent Ushari the snake to bite Kion so he can experience my pain. Wait, it looks cool. Shut up. Motherfucking goddamn it. So the one time I agree with Simba, remember how I agreed with him being like, oh, we got to play the offense. Like, let's, let's take down Scar once and for all. Mufasa disagrees with this, saying you can't fight fire with fire. So how does Kion take down Scar? He says, I forgive you and blows a little kiss his way, and, and his love kills him. <laughs> okay, I might have been exaggerating, but genuinely only a little. He does say I forgive you to Scar, which made me eye roll so hard I got dizzy. And he did blow in the clouds, which made it rain. Since when could he do that? The rain doused the fire and Scar was defeated, I guess. Uh, so he really didn't recruit Zira? Seems like a wasted opportunity, but I get it. Lion King 2 had to happen. Also, the snake fell in the volcano. Snake fully died. No one acknowledges it. Can we talk about how Scar's plan sucked ass? All it amounted to was, you look like me now. Now we're both, we both have scars. Scar, Scar, Scar. It's also, it's also my name. Oh shit. So actually, apparently the venom from the snake can affect decision making and morality? Since when? Now I kind of feel bad for Scar. Are you telling me he couldn't help it? Also in the volcano, Ono lost his vision. So now Unga, I forgot to mention Unga. I didn't think she'd be important. She's an eagle we met a few episodes ago. Anyway, now Unga is keenest of sight. Everyone say hi. Second girl on the guard and she's goth. We love a trailblazer. So Ono temporarily lost his tattoo, but he gets a new one because they made a new role for him. Now Ono is the smartest. I didn't, I didn't know they could do that. The setup for this season is that Kion and the rest of the Lion Guard have to get to the Tree of Life, which will hopefully heal Kion and Ono. Okay, so before we move on, everyone in the Pride Lands knows that Kion is going to the Tree of Life to heal his scar. So why the fuck in the second movie do they shit on Kovu's scar so much? Evil as clear as the scar on his face. Are you guys for real? Simba, say something! Kion with all his angst this season is reminding me of Steven Universe future Steven and at the risk of sounding like the biggest dork on the planet, it hurts. It hurts seeing a beacon of unconditional kindness and love and forgiveness struggle like this. I understand they had to be flawed, but did they really have to? Did you think about that? Did you think about the fact that it made me sad? And that maybe I wasn't expecting this from the Lion Guard and now I'm embarrassed? Ono being the smartest was a really interesting journey for his character. We still get a close up of his eyes, but then it moves inwards. We see him visualizing the whole map. They really do need him still, but he's struggling with his new role. This also isn't necessarily a new role. I mean, he was always the smartest. They just never said it. Every time he knew something the rest of the group didn't, he would always try and downplay it. Like, common knowledge, really. He would always say that. Common knowledge, really. Apparently not. Obviously, it's not common knowledge. You're just, you're just a smart dude. Makucha, the leopard that lives in the Backlands, is the new main villain of the series? Dude, we met him as early as season one with that dang a copy. I did not think he was going to be this important. Makucha's objective is to follow the Lion Guard to the Tree of Life, and once he gets there, he wants to eat all the injured animals. Few know the way, so it sucks that Makini was just casually mentioning this with an earshot of him. Girl, shut up! Shut up! Rafiki's main lesson to her as a student is know when to stop talking. And she still hasn't learned that? Even with this whole time jump? What will you learn? That your actions have consequences! 
Season 3, Episode 5 goes to the mountain. The Lion Guard protect a group of red pandas against the snow leopard. See, they always take the prey's side, which because of the show's demographic makes sense, but that's not what the circle of life is about. But on the other hand, how do you show the actual circle of life without getting all Animal Planet? The snow leopard teams up with the other leopard, Makucha, and I wrote in my notes here, are they going to make a whole new league of villains this way? Yes, Athena, be patient, I'm getting there. Season 3, Episode 7, Dragon Island. Kion's roar accidentally cleared part of the ocean and he turned a peninsula into an island. He's not doing too well. Also, Bestie is the sweetest boy. This dolphin is burning in the sun. And he says, yeah, us hippos burn really easily too. Oh wait, I have an idea. And he stands in front of her. Hippos are not like that in real life, guys. They are killing machines. Never forget it. The Lion Guard prevents a Komodo dragon from eating this dolphin. And as a result, the Komodo dragon joins the villains. Weird side note, I'm learning about a lot of really weird predator-prey dynamics. Snow leopards hunting red pandas? That's real. Komodo dragons eating beetles? dolphins, that's also something that happens. The circle of life can be so cruel in real life when the lion guard isn't there to stop it. I mean, I mean, protect it. Season 3, episode 9, The Chase to Taliza, Kion keeps snapping at Bunga, to the point where even Bunga gets a little scared. Reminder, this dude is fearless, but this throws him off guard. That's supposed to be his best friend right there. At first, Kion was the only one that could tolerate him. So it's so sad to see these two have so many problems this season. Hey, Kion, want to splash in this puddle? You are such a childish fucking loser! Whoa, man, calm down. Holy shit, never mind. Damn! I forgot to mention, the plant Taliza temporarily calms down Kion when his scar hurts. My scar. It, it hurts. hurts. That was a Jax Films reference, which reminds me, I have a collab with that guy. Cause my life's a movie. Season 3, episode 10, Mama Binturong. We meet Mama Binturong. If you're like me, you're thinking, what the hell's a Binturong? <laughs> Guys, this is a Binturong. Isn't she incredible? What a fascinating Frankenstein's monster of familiar features. Is that not just the face of a raccoon, the paws of a wolverine, and the tail of a fox combined in such a way to maximize my discomfort? I love it. She looks like she's gonna put a curse on my whole bloodline. What a cutie. Here's a picture of another one. Now now it looks completely different. This one looks more like a koala. Maybe even a drop bear? What the fuck? Back to the show, Mama Binturong controls this forest through fear. She has porcupine henchmen, and her one objective is to keep all the Taliza for herself. Taliza, you know, the plant that helps Kion not go sicko mode. She steals Makini's staff, which has their stash of Taliza. And Bunga made a new enemy, because not only did he steal the staff back, but he also farted. Yeah, farting is one of his main powers. I wanted to see how far I can get without mentioning it, but he farts and destroys her whole stash of Taliza. Season 3, episode 12, The Tree of Life, we meet the Night Pride, a group of lions similar to the guard that protects the Tree of Life. Rainy, the leader of the Night Pride, can talk to her dead parents in the clouds. Oh my gosh, she's just like Kion. If it wasn't obvious these two will get together despite their rough start, it definitely is now. Oh, and she's not just the leader of the Night Pride. She's also the future queen. Wow, is Kion going to be a king after all? This dude gets everything except a feature on Lion King 2. Season 3, episode 13, The River of Patience. Kion's first lesson to help him heal is to learn patience. This is especially difficult when he learns that the group of villains followed him here. He wants to help the Night Pride fight, but they tell him to stay out of their way. On top of that, the wise grandma lion says, you can't help anybody until you help yourself. Love that. At the end of the episode, Mama Binturong finally joins the villains. I'm Mama Binturong, and I'm your new leader. I'm obsessed with her. <laughs> Season 3, episode 14, Little Old Jinterbong. Mama Binturong's plan is actually perfect. The rest of the villains hunt her so that the Night Pride takes her in to protect her. Something else that works in her favor is that Bunga is the only one that's actually seen what she looks like. And conveniently enough, he's separate from the rest of the group this episode because he's playing with the girl hunting badger. <laughs> you can tell she's a girl because she's pink. Ono's eyesight has improved, but it'll never be the same as it once was. I really appreciate that it's not 100% back to the way it was and that Unga continues to be the keenest of sight, but something that annoyed me is the really convenient timing of everything. I, I wish that some things they set up more. Like this plot, Mama Binturong never would have been caught if Ono's eyesight didn't improve because he's the only one that noticed her shadiness. Season three, episode 16, Long Live the Queen. This episode starts with a content warning that says the following episode contains some scenes that deal with the circle of life and may be intense for younger viewers. Parents may want to watch this with their kids. 
ha ha ha, it's going down. So I grabbed my mom and we watched this episode together. So guys, apparently the depictions of the circle of life just meant dying of old age. The grandma died. I understand that losing someone is difficult no matter what, but I, I don't know. I thought that the disclaimer meant we were going to be seeing Animal Planet. I gotta stop thinking we're going to see Animal Planet. Plus, if they did go there, I, I would cry a lot, so I don't know why I'm acting disappointed. There's a reason I cover kids shows. <laughs> Rainy is the new queen of the Tree of Life. Kion hasn't talked to Mufasa all season because he was scared of him seeing his scar. Mufasa tells Kion he'll always be there for him, but can you imagine if he appeared in the clouds and was like, <laughs> You have a scar! <laughs> I would call you Scar now! Scar, 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 Scar. And like he learned nothing from the first time he did that. Season 3, episode 17, The Lake of Reflection. Kion starts talking to the sky again, and I think Mufasa's gonna appear as he usually does. But instead, Kion is talking to the first leader of the Lion Guard, Ascari. I'm surprised Kion was able to talk to him without crying. Ascari. <laughs> what did you say about my scar? Stupid joke, stupid joke. Kion has been dealing with his emotions really well in therapy. And it's really cool that he can talk to his ancestors from like hundreds of years ago. Anyway, Kion is talking to Ascari about giving back the roar. Kion pretty much admitted feeling like he couldn't handle this power anymore. And then Ascari hits him with, then you're ready to figure out all that this power can do. And Kion was like, Fuck yeah. Dude, what a 180. I don't think I deserve this power. What? I get to keep it and it's even more powerful than I could ever imagine? Let's fucking do this thing. The next episode, Triumph of the Roar, actually clarifies that Kion is training with Ascari to learn all that the Roar can do because he's willing to give it away. This isn't a, you did so good, let me do the opposite. I think it's more of a good choice. We really are taking this thing away from you once you see how cool it is. At least I hope that's where they're going. It would be so much more impactful if they actually followed through with that. So as part of Kion's training, he picks up a rock with his roar and flips it upside down. So far, the roar has not only blown people away and things as big as the ocean away, but it can also control the weather and has telekinetic abilities. Bro! In a song called Power of the Roar, the Power of the Roar, we see him actually actually being able to lift the earth beneath him. And then in the battle, he's able to summon a tornado and control where lightning strikes. He's mastered all four elements. And he even blasted the bad guys away. Looks like Team Rocket's blasting off again! How long has he been training? Like, like how long has he been training? Rainy sees Kion being a badass and is like, hey, uh, we should move in together. And he's like, what? I mean, yeah, yes, yeah, I accept. But what? How long have these two known each other? Like, it's obvious they're gonna be husband and wife, but aren't they still 14 years old? Season three, episode 19, Journey to the Pride Lands. Rainy is not being subtle. She straight up brought up marriage. Here's how quickly things escalated. You're so independent. You're gonna make a great queen. Yeah, but it wouldn't hurt to have a king like you by my side. Like me? Kion and his friends have to go back to the Pride Lands to defend it against Zira. Dude, Lion King 2 is happening right now! The only person who stayed behind is Makini because she's going to be the royal Majuzi for the Tree of Life. Janja and Jasiri also join them, and so does that male cheetah that they forced into the story to be Fooly's love interest. On the way back, Kion keeps using the roar for everything. And to his credit, it works 99% of the time. But it's no replacement for the power of friendship, I'll tell you that right now. Series finale returns to the Pride Lands. Kion and the guard arrive home. Kovu and Kiara are like, oh, okay, here's what you miss, and played the entirety of The Lion King 2 for them. Kion and Kiara have this brother-sisterly moment where he was like, so you got married? <laughs> so did I, kind of. And something that really bothers me about this scene is that they should have referenced Lion King 2 a bit more because Kiara looked a lot older and larger in that movie. And here they animate her like she's still a cub. So here's where things get interesting. There's a new lion guard being led by Kovu's sister. Kind of fucked up to hire new people during your son's mental health crisis without even letting him know he's been fired. So they have a competition. New Lion Guard against Old Lion Guard. Fiercest versus each other, bravest versus each other, strongest versus each other, keenest of sight versus each other, and fastest versus each other. All the original roles. The new team doesn't have insight, so Ono oh is the judge? How is he supposed to be unbiased? Okay, so the new Lion Guard won all the challenges, but those guys right there are my friends. And the reason I have a job in the first place, you know what I mean? So do I still have the job if I choose the new Lion Guard? Why would I, why would I choose them? What's in it for me? The contest was a tie up until the last challenge, the fiercest. They were about to have a Mashindano, and Kion essentially turned to his competitor and said, I can 
kill you, you know, you don't have to do this. Well, not exactly that, but he did say something along the lines of, my roar is very powerful, this is not an even fight. And she snaps back with, whatever, I'm still gonna try. And he was like, damn. <laughs> You really are the fiercest. And he declares the new Lion Guard as the true Lion Guard. But hold up, motherfucker. I thought Ono was supposed to be the judge. I would have loved to see Ono snap. Kion, what are you doing? Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. You are not going to ruin this for me. <laughs> Kion, <laughs> everybody. Humble King. Humble King right here. That's why he should be the leader of the Lion Guard. He won. Because I'm, I'm the fucking judge. But for some reason that doesn't happen. And the Lion Guard roles are given to the new Lion Guard. Their sick tattoos disappear and appear on Kobu's sister's team. And Kobu's sister also gets the roar. A powerful sacrifice. Roll credits. Roll credits. Roll t no. Kion gets to keep the roar and be a part of the Night Pride with all of his friends. But there already is a Night Pride. What's gonna happen to those guys? Are they gonna force them to retire? Kion also lifted up Pride Rock at the end. I would have freaked out. Brother, please, that's our home. Be careful. You and Kobu have to find a new place, all right? Because I'm taking this back to the Tree of Life. <gasps> I earned it. So yeah, Kion is the king of the Tree of Life, and the series ends with him marrying Rainy. That was a lot. Athena's final thoughts. Obviously, I think it would have been more impactful if he didn't keep the roar, but season three was still very entertaining. And it was interesting to see how they dealt with the giant obstacle of Kion not existing in The Lion King 2. I thought almost every ship was forced. But I did like fully taking care of Kion and having his back and stepping in as leader when he was getting really aggravated. And I love that they did all of that with no romantic implications. I was surprised to see how many Fooly and Kion shippers there are out there because I cannot emphasize enough how much I don't see it. Something disappointing but not surprising is that it seems like the future of the Lion King franchise has no plans to acknowledge this series as canon. A lot of people bring up spinoffs as easy cash grabs, banking off of people's nostalgia, but I think that's a very surface level look at what's going on here. I commend the creativity of people that have to work within strange parameters. This show was beyond creative. I didn't see half of this shit coming. Maybe, maybe a lot of you are just gonna be like, that's just because you are stupid, but like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't imagine that somebody could watch episode one and know exactly what's going to happen at the end. And when you look at shows and movies that want to be the next Star Wars, expanding these universes so, so much, like sure, it could be seen as greed, or it can be seen as a beautiful thing that these stories stick with people so much that they want to see even more. Maybe it's a mix of both. Listen, there are always new stories to tell, but I don't subscribe to the idea of writing off every sequel. In fact, the last time I did that, I regretted it because I haven't seen the Trolls movie since the first one and it's expanded so much. It looks like so much fun. I'm even entertaining the idea of maybe doing Trolls movie lore. Let me know if you'd be interested in that. And I really hope you enjoyed this video, butt lovers. I just want to let you guys know that there is a forum on my Discord called Things Athena P Missed in her lore videos. And I'm planning on making a video talking about everything I missed in my lore videos. So if you have a few things that pop into your mind, definitely check it out. Be sure to drop it in this Discord. Next week, I'm reading some stupid Christmas shit. Stay tuned and have a great day. If you enjoyed, please subscribe. Bye!